it's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. I found some interesting tapes in my grandfather's attic by Deacon Clark. An aneurysm, that's what we were told by the coroner. A pop blood vessel in my grandfather's head had killed him. A stubborn, no-nonsense man who'd survived wars had died in bed to something that made his brain break. Well, sorry, I refused to believe it. No one was particularly bothered about my grandfather passing. He was, in truth, a rather reclusive individual. He severed ties with my mother after she decided to elope with the man of her dreams. My auntie disowned him even earlier. She never saw a father figure. Instead, all she saw was an uncaring, unapologetic monster with the face of her father. My relationship with my grandfather, however, was great. He jumped at the chance to see me and seemingly spent all our time together. When I turned ten, my grandfather started to tell me stories of his life, mostly about how he was a great filmmaker during his time in Afghanistan, and some of the times afterwards, though, he'd all but given up filmmaking once my grandmother had passed away. She'd also died from an aneurysm in bed, but at least it was during her sleep, so it was peaceful. She'd passed away long before I was born, and it had always pained me that I never got to know her properly. My grandfather spoke of her like she was an angel. He'd pull out tapes of them in the 70s and 80s. They laughed and posed in different locations around the world. Paris, Rome, London. They'd seemingly visited everywhere. I don't really remember the tapes too well, but well, I'm getting sidetracked. So, my grandfather had passed away and his house had been left to me. I decided to sell it to pay for the funeral costs. Since I own the house and all of its contents fell to me to rifle through the mess of what was junk and what had value. No help was given from my mother, who had been ridden out of my grandfather's will, nor did any help come from my auntie or cousins, who had also washed their collective hands of my grandfather. I stared out the double windows of the master bedroom, watching as the thickest snowfall in months descended onto the garden below. When I started sorting out the items from the house, I decided that starting from the top was a good idea. So I started in the attic and made my way downwards. I opened the walk-in wardrobe and screamed. Oh, a mountain of coats, shoes, hats and bags, all taken from a bygone era, fell on top of me. After eventually breaking free, I began sifting through the pile in the hopes that I could find something. Well, hell, anything of value, but it was like trying to get blood from a stone. As I delved deeper and deeper into the wardrobe, I must have disturbed a rodent or some small beast as something ran over my hands. In a start panic, I lurched backwards and hit the wall hard, causing a mass of boxes to fall on me from above. All I could do was exclaim, oh, Come on already! As well as some other very choice words. Clearing away the boxes from around me, I looked upwards to see whereabouts they'd fallen from. An empty shelf accompanied by a large dust cloud lingered above as well as... Hmm, Something else. A lock, similar to what you'd find in a garage door, lay attached to a section of the ceiling. As curiosity got the better of me, I reached and fumbled with the lock. Well, to no surprise, it was firmly locked. If I know my grandfather, there was only ever one place he would have hidden a key for this. The coal shed that sat forgotten at the bottom of the garden. As I opened the kitchen door, I found the snow had risen past my shins, Grabbing a pair of my grandfather's hiking boots, I laid up and began the trip. The trudge through the knee-high snow was a chore, so I was shifting it away from the door to the coal shed. Well, I guess if you don't live in Britain I should explain. A coal shed is a place where you'd store coal for your fires. Although this coal shed hadn't seen coal since the 1980s, instead it now housed a broken, rideable mower and bikes that were more rust than metal. At the back of the shed, Discarded and forgotten was Grandfather's rucksack, a memento he'd taken from his time in Afghanistan. My grandfather told me that when he went on his trips away, he'd always take it with him, but the old bag hadn't seen much use for some time. Not being too careful, I flipped the bag and emptied its contents. A Swiss army knife, a disposable camera, a water container and a few rolls of film all clunked to the ground, but annoyingly, no key. 
Frustrated, I threw the bag at the wall, and then the nearest item to me, the camera. Time felt slowed as the disposable camera hit the wall and smashed open. There, laying amongst the broken parts, was what looked like a large fish key. While mulling the key in my fingers, I found the letters CHS neatly printed in the metal. In all of my grandfather's stories, I'd never heard of CHS. Shaking my head, I pocketed the key, the knife and the film, and began the arduous task of trekking back to the house. As I got back inside, it felt cold. Not cold as in chilly, but cold as in all the life had been sucked from it. I briskly made my way to the master bedroom and into the walk-in wardrobe. I lifted the key, and it fitted perfectly, and with a satisfying click, the hatch to the attic came down. As I climbed, I remembered I'd already been in the attic and cleared it out. The room I was in looked undisturbed. The room was small, with one side housing a small circular window that looked out onto the garden, and on the other side a dry wall that must have split the attic apart. I chuckled to myself. <laughs> it's funny what you tend to miss when you're working. In the room were six cardboard boxes, all sealed, and three wooden crates, all of which were stamped with the familiar CHS. Sat atop one of the crates was an old box TV that had a built-in VCR and a thick helping of dust over it. Using my sleeve, I cleared away most of the dust and found the power switch for the TV. As big a surprise it was, well, the TV came to life, blasting and blaring its white static at me. Oh, try as I could, I just could not find a working channel, so I turned to the VCR channel instead. Taking out the knife, I cut open one of the boxes closest to me, hoping to uncover more of whatever was going on. Inside lay ten tapes, seven of which were cracked and unplayable. I opened another box, finding more tapes, both broken and well, others in near-mint condition. After scouring all the boxes, I found a total of nine tapes out of a possible thirty that were in playable condition. I had also found a machine that would be able to attach film tapes to empty cassettes. Fishing around in my pockets, I pulled out the tape and applied it to the machine. After finding a handful of empty cassettes, I placed everything in the machine and let it do its job. Focusing back towards the other tapes, I organized them in date order, with the latest being last. All the tapes had the same stamp of CHS somewhere on their label, as well as a few words. I picked up the first one labelled, Skies of Scotland, 7th of September, 99. Pushed the video cassette into the TV and hit play. Oh, now my curiosity had hit its peak. A brief title card appeared with the text, Property of the Cryptozoological Hunter Society. The Hunt for the Pteranodon. Lake District, Scotland, 99. The camera cut to an outdoor viewing platform on what looked like a mini blimp of some sort. A man dressed in black and white camo outfits stood with a pair of binoculars pointed to the sky. Ryan, get that gun ready. She's going to make another pass, the man shouted, barely being audible over the rushing wind. Another man dressed in all black, militarized hunting garb steadily moved into frame, holding what looked like a mobile cannon. Fire! A large plume of smoke covered the camera's view as what sounded like a large bird squawking in pain rang through the speakers. The man shouting orders quickly turned to the camera, his face now in shock. Foster, get down! The cameraman dropped and rolled as a large shadow flew over the top of him. Fire again, Ryan, shouted the man. Another loud bang was heard and smoke covered the screen. The large shadow spiraled past the camera and fell somewhere off screen. My Joe Ryan, you hit it. Well done. Foster, you still alive there? The man asked. Shaken, the cameraman stood up and spoke. I'm fine, George, but next time you get to turn your back to the beasts. That voice... I'd heard it before. It was my grandfather's voice. He was the cameraman. The next screen briefly cut to static before resuming. All three men, including my grandfather, stood next to some prehistoric-looking animal. Great work, chaps. Now that we've found the beast, who fancies a cup of tea? George asked. 
Both Ryan and my grandfather declined with a typical, Nah. As Ryan and George prepared to move the beast, my grandfather ran to the camera and the footage ended. I tried to reflect on what I'd just watched, but my normal scientific mind was having none of it. I ejected the video, placing it next to the TV. I picked up the next tape and read the label. Unknown location. Shadow Monster. 8th of February, 2000. Pushing the tape into the VCR, a new title card appeared, this one reading, Property of the Cryptozoological Hunter Society, Hunt for the Shadow Beast, The Backrooms, Dortmund, 2000. The camera cut to the outside of an abandoned industrial area where both Ryan and George looked on. Alright chaps, here's the plan. Both I and Foster will go exploring and looking for this shadowy monster. Ryan, you're the strongest, so we need you to keep the door open for us. Ryan looked at the building and then at George. George, if you think that you and Foster can take on whatever is supposed to be in there, then good luck to you, laughed Ryan. But Ryan, George, and then my grandfather struggled to open the door, but eventually they managed. The room just beyond looked wrong, almost as if it belonged to another dimension. The sickly cream-coloured walls and doorless doorways left the impression of a maze. Now, Foster, follow me and don't get the cable snagged. It's bloody well difficult to escape these back rooms. Oh, come off it, George. You know this place is too dangerous to be hunting inside. George ignored my grandfather's plea and continued moving from room to room searching for the monster. Every room both George and my grandfather entered... Looked like the last, until George entered a room that seemingly sucked all the light out of it. George entered the room, but quickly began shouting, Get back! Get back, I say! Foster, run! George ran as fast as he could, past my grandfather, who continued to film the doorway. All the light unnaturally began to fade as what looked like a living mass of shadow with twin bulbous eyes glided through the door. My grandfather took off running after George. This forced the camera's already shaky visuals to become unrecognizable. For a good solid hour of footage, both my grandfather and George ran from room to room, trying desperately to avoid the shadow monster. I kept getting a glimpse as the camera swung from my grandfather's hand, the monster seemingly gaining distance on the two men. Foster, look there to the right, shouted George. A doorway that looked very out of place and which was bleeding natural sunlight came into view. Standing at the door was Ryan, holding some kind of futuristic-looking gun. Both my grandfather and George burst through the doorway, pushing Ryan back and causing the door to slam shut behind them. The camera landed right into Ryan's face, leading him to say, oh, Get that camera out of my face, Foster, or I'll use this solar harnessing incineration tech on you. The video cut out once more, and I was left again with the static of the TV. I sat, contemplating what had happened. Was my grandfather really a cameraman for some shady hunting corporation? Or was this some sort of over-elaborated TV show he once told me he'd started? Regardless, I was becoming hooked on these tapes, so I took out the next one. This tape looked battered and read, Kentucky, Giant Strawman. 11th of June, 2001. The ever-so-popular title card popped up again, saying the now infamous lines. Property of the Cryptozoological Hunter Society. The giant living scarecrow. Dukedom, Kentucky. 2002. Well, I couldn't help but chuckle a little to myself as I read that note. The camera cut to the inside of a moving flatbed truck. George took the steering wheel and Ryan was in the back, holding onto the side. Foster, over there to your right. There it is, George exclaimed excitedly. My grandfather turned to face the behemoth and my jaw dropped. Slowly walking through the cornfields, as big as a house, was a scarecrow. Its head was made from a white malted pumpkin with what looked to be a comically large witch's hat. The body was made from straw wrapped in a black and red flannel shirt, and its trousers were standard, ripped denim jeans. All right, Ryan, when I get to the side of it, 
When you get a clear shot, shoot the beggar down, bellowed George over the engine. George pressed down on the gas and hit nearly a hundred miles an hour. Ryan had now attached himself onto the flatbed and held up what looked like a red firework cannon, holding it between his legs and aiming it like it was a mortar. Ryan lit the fuse and several streaks of red flew towards the scarecrow. The first two flares missed the target, but the last five hit, and this sent the scarecrow into an ungodly scream. It sounded like a woman wailing at the top of her lungs, a sound only a professional opera singer could make. Fairly soon the scarecrow stopped walking and collapsed, still screaming and burning away. By jolly, you hit it, Ryan. Good show, old chap, George said, clearly impressed. As George stopped the car, all three men disembarked and began walking towards the flaming field. With a smile, George turned to my grandfather. That's all she wrote, Albin. Now, who's up for a spot of tea? The tape cut out, and a very uncomfortable feeling grew in the pit of my stomach. Was my grandfather really fine filming this? I popped out the tape and added it to the growing pile next to the TV. A deathly chill quickly assaulted me, and I was reminded of the heavy winter snow outside. I stuck my head out of the window and looked over the back garden. Where I'd once walked through the snow not even a few hours before, now lay a thicker coating of snow that had completely covered my tracks. As I looked over the snowfall, I swore for a second I saw someone standing next to the coal shed. Someone tall with an oddly shaped head. I blinked, and once again there was nothing but an undisturbed winter wonderland. Shivering, I walked back to the attic hatch and made my way down. I decided I needed to feel some warmth, and being up in that attic wouldn't do me much good. I shifted my frozen fingers over the boiler and pumped up the heat, desperately craving for the comfort of warmth. I brewed myself a coffee and headed back towards the attic. My curious mind wanted to know more about the remaining tapes and what was on them. As I pulled the hat shut behind me, I once again took my seat and pulled out the next tape. The label was starting to peel away and I was unable to read much. All I could make out was the 2nd of June 2002. I put the tape into the video player and began to play what I had now dubbed The Wacky Adventures of Grandfather Foster. As the title card appeared, I celebrated over-enthusiastically and read out the card. Property of the Cryptozoological Hunter Society. Living Mannequins. Drummond. Republic of Ireland. 2002. My grandfather sat in the driver's seat of the car facing the road. On the seat to his left was a CB radio that sprung to life. Come in, Yankee. This is Redcoat. Do you copy? Over. George's ever-so-familiar British accent erupted from the radio. My grandfather picked up the radio and responded. This is Yankee. Copy. Any sign of our living war? Over. This is Redcoat. No visual contact. Over. How about you, Red Dragon? Over. And the very angry voice of Ryan came through the radio. No sign. Copy. And why am I the Red Dragon? Is this because I'm Welsh? Over. I couldn't help but chuckle along with both George and my grandfather. It did seem quite funny, although I was surprised my grandfather would have allowed anyone to call him a Yankee. For years he tried to distance himself with the fact that he was originally born in America and had moved to Britain. But with company like George and Ryan, he must have gotten used to it. As my grandfather slowly drove forward, he stopped and turned on his high beam. Not ten feet away, in the middle of the road, was a solid brick wall, perfectly laid across the road. Interwoven within the wall were different parts of mannequins, all of which ranged in shapes and sizes. My grandfather sat almost speechless, staring at the wall. As I watched on, I could feel the wall watching my grandfather's car, waiting for him to make a move. Without moving the camera, my grandfather slowly reached for the CB radio and pushed the button. Come in, red coat and red dragon. I found the wall. Over. George's voice came crackling loudly over the radio, loud enough to startle the mannequins in the wall. 
Why, Jolly? What does it look like? Oh, never mind. Both myself and Red Dragon are on our way. As soon as silence fell again, the mannequin parts began to twitch erratically, and different parts began to pour themselves across the wall. Within a few sweet seconds, a large amalgamation of crimson mannequin parts, roughly shaped like a person, quickly began approaching the car. My grandfather began to panic as it drew ever closer. He placed the video recorder onto the dashboard and got out of his car. This was the first time I'd seen my grandfather in the tapes. In truth, he didn't look much different, only less grey and more athletic. He pulled something out of his jacket pocket and threw it towards the mannequin. An explosion shook the car and knocked the camera from the dashboard. More explosions soon sounded, as well as an ear-piercing shriek similar to that of a lamb who had been set upon by wild dogs. The car rocked back and forth with every explosion, most probably from how close they were to the vehicle, but then, silence. Four minutes of the silence, my grandfather returned to the car and placed the camera back onto the dashboard. The crimson mannequin and the wall were both in smouldering pieces, sprawled in front of the car. My grandfather picked up the CB radio and contacted George and Ryan. Come in, Red Coat and Red Dragon. The wall and the mannequin is down. I repeat, the wall and the mannequin is down. Over. George, a little upset, responded as such. Oh, you destroyed it. I guess I'll have to watch the tape to see it. Good copy. Over. My grandfather sighed and grabbed the camera, quipping. Oh, I need a vacation soon. Before turning off the camera. I ejected the tape and hastily grabbed the next one. I was sucked in and really enjoying these tapes. Oh, there was something drawing me in. Seeing a side of my grandfather he'd never told me about, or anyone else. Oh, the next tape simply read, Kraken, Cyprus, 17th of September, 2002. I drummed up the arrival of the title card on my legs and once again gave off a huge cheer for it. Property of the Cryptozoological Hunter Society. The Kraken... Paia, Cyprus, 2002. The camera started on a beach. There were no clouds in the sky, no hustle and bustle, not even a single seagull circling above, just beaches and the sea. My grandfather stood next to the same white flatback truck from the Scarecrow video. Turning sharply, my grandfather took the camera and pointed it back towards whom was originally carrying it, George. With his overconfidence... George pointed down the beach. See that large mass spread across the beach, old chap? That's the Kraken the A.S. Neptune shot it a few hours ago. Now, as we speak, Ryan is planting the explosive to help us remove this unsightly thing. As my grandfather and George made their way down the beach, the Kraken came into view, and for the second time today, I was left speechless. Sprawled across the sand was a giant octopus, bigger than anything I could reasonably compare it to. Hundreds of what looked to be bone-like spikes protruded from the beast's tentacles, and around its greyish body, a large, luminous, sickly yellow eye stared directly to the sky. George slowly made his way down from the sandy slope of the beach and towards Ryan, who was placing large explosive charges in and around the beast's mouth. As my grandfather got closer, I could get a much better comparison of sizes. Now, my grandfather was at least six foot three, but he seemed almost dwarfed in comparison to this cephalopod. Reaching the camera through the Kraken's open beak, I could see all the way down to the stomach. Rows upon rows of sharp teeth stuck out from the beast's mouth, razored and ready to shred, almost like a blender. Foster, old chap, come over here. We're about to start detonation. My grandfather turned to face George, but as he did, a deafening screech emitted from the supposedly dead cracker. Quickly running away, a large tentacle swung over my grandfather's head and hit the water, causing a huge wave to head towards the beach. George and Ryan quickly grabbed my grandfather and hoisted him up the sandy hill. Ready, Ryan. Detonate now. Now! bellowed George. The camera dropped to the floor and pointed towards George, Ryan, and my grandfather. Within seconds, multiple mini-explosives detonated simultaneously, blowing the crack into pieces. 
chunks of the beast rained from the sky, as well as a torrent of blood that completely drenched all three men. Chuckling to himself, Ryan asked, Does anyone fancy some calamari? George smacked Ryan over the back of the head as my grandfather recovered the camera. Any last damage, old boy? shouted George. Nope, no problem, it's still recording fine. There's a good chap, Foster. And with that, the film ended, and I came back to the familiar sight of the static screen. I blinked a few times, trying to understand what I'd just seen. A giant kraken that was blown up off the coast of Cyprus. How had I not heard of something like that? In truth, it wasn't the strangest thing I'd seen in the videotapes, but it did leave an impression on me. I grabbed the next tape and read its label. Alligator Man, Florida, 27th of November, 2003. I remembered this date. It was my grandmother's birthday. Every year I'd go and visit my grandfather and he would go to her grave. I remember showing up to his house and seeing the letter hastily plastered on his door. To Howard, I know we normally spend today together, but I've decided to go and see some friends in Florida. We'll be back by December, Grandad. So he was hunting monsters instead of seeing me and on grandmother's birthday. My opinion of my grandfather quickly took a large dive. Annoyed, I put the tape into the VCR and awaited the title card. Property of the Cryptozoological Hunter Society. Alligator Man, Rochelle, Florida, 2003. The footage began with my grandfather filming Ryan. He was seemingly loading what looked like a double-barreled elephant gun. Jesus, Foster, if you keep filming me, people will start to think we're an item. Hopefully I won't be killed like your last partner. My grandfather went serious and retorted with, You know it's my wife's birthday. If you say anything like that again, I'll shove this gun so far up your ass, you'll be able to reload it with your tongue. Ryan hopped out of the truck and began quickly marching over to my grandfather, prepping his fists. The camera fell onto the dead grass path, and soon Ryan joined it on the floor. I know even if Ryan was a fully trained soldier, he wouldn't have stood a chance. My grandfather was a former member of the Red Beret Commandos, the people the government went to when the Green Beret Commandos failed. By job, Ryan, what are you doing on the floor? quizzed George from out of the frame. Nothing. George was just having a little fun with Foster. My grandfather helped Ryan and grabbed the camera from the floor. Oh, God damn it, Ryan. The screen's cracked. You're lucky the lens didn't crack on that fall. Ryan puffed out his chest as he went back to prepping his weapons for the upcoming fight. My grandfather turned to face George, who was standing outside a large metal grate built into a concrete wall. The wall was covered in graffiti ranging from warnings of reptilian sewer people to pro-presidential propaganda. There was even very faded spraying of Kilroy looking over his mini wall. Hey, George, shouted my grandfather. What is it, Foster, old boy? Are you sure there's actually a gator man in these sewers? Because I don't want a repeat of the wild goose chase we had hunting that giant spider in dairy sewers. Now, Foster, old bean... We have both photographic and video recordings of the beast. I'm sure this one is real. George took the camera from my grandfather as he and Ryan attempted to move the rusted iron gate. With no luck moving it, Ryan set up two small bricks of C4 around the hinges and blew the grate clean off. Well, if the gator man didn't know we were coming, he does now, quit my grandfather. Ryan lifted his middle finger and pointed it towards my grandfather as all three men entered the storm drain. You know, I always thought it was a myth, started Ryan. I always thought that if a lazy American, no offense, Foster, that if a lazy American flushed a baby crocodile down the toilet, it'd survive and live in the sewers. Oh, you got it wrong, Ryan. First, it's alligators here, not crocodiles. And these aren't pets flushed away by some wealthy family. Oh, these alligators came in from the rivers and lakes, looking for somewhere quiet to nest, said my grandfather. Ryan cocked his gun and turned on his flashlight, deciding he should lead the group into the sewers. Next, my grandfather walked in and switched the camera to night vision mode. 
and this did little to light up the distance in front of Ryan. Finally, George entered, brandishing a large rifle. All right, chaps, we need to kill this beast before it has a chance to sniff us coming. Be thankful we shall mostly be downwind in these pipes. My grandfather bent down and grabbed a handful of brown sewerage sludge and began smearing it over his body. Ryan stopped in his tracks as the pipe opened into a large cistern chamber. The chamber was pure concrete, but riddled with cracks and missing chunks. There was also some more unsightly graffiti spread across the walls. Several separate pipes led out of the chamber, with three of them labelled by distinctive graffiti. The first pipe had a crudely sprayed picture of a light grey man fast asleep. The second pipe had the same man, only now he was crouched eating. The final image was of the man swimming. I call the second pipe, said Ryan, eyeing the artwork above it. Oh really? Why is that? asked my grandfather. It's the beast's feeding room. It's most likely to be there, right? laughed Ryan. I hate to break it to you, Ryan, but alligators are nocturnal hunters, so chances are our alligator man will be sleeping and not eating. George stepped in between my grandfather and Ryan. Right, chaps, say Foster is right and Mr. Alligator is sleeping when we have him trapped. But say that Ryan's right and the beast's eating. If we go down the wrong pipe, we could be attacked from behind. I propose we load up and take one tunnel each. Ryan and my grandfather agreed. My grandfather fitted the camera onto a holder on his shoulder and swung a rifle similar to George's from his side. Foster, old boy, you go and check out the feeding tunnel. I'll look into the pool tunnel. But my grandfather didn't argue, although I knew he wanted to. He was a man who would take only calculated risks. As my grandfather took his first steps into the tunnel, he once again took a handful of sludge and coated himself with it. The night vision on the camera didn't reveal much, and I'm positive that my grandfather wouldn't have had his light on in case it revealed his location. Crunch. The sound of a foot treading on broken bones echoed unsettlingly through the tunnel. My grandfather looked down to see the discarded bones of some four-legged animals, all of which had been picked clean. A warm, putrid-scented smell wafted up my grandfather's nose, causing him to gag. Jesus, it smells like decayed dog breath, was what I think he said through clenched teeth. A growl echoed down the tunnel, sounding far too loud for any normal alligator, even with the natural sound amplifier from the tunnel. Laying down, my grandfather crawled as close as he could to the wall, making sure to coat himself in as much muck from the floor as possible. Unfortunately, as he crawled, he lost grip on his gun, which became lost in bone debris on the floor. My grandfather stuck out his arm trying to reach it, but quickly reeled it back as something approached. It crawled slowly past the fitting my grandfather hid in, his body roughly stretching about seven feet. Its scales were scuffed and grey, while the white of its underbelly was smeared with the sludge of the floor. Its eyes seemed damaged, almost mutilated, and left to heal incorrectly. It was all but blind, but then again, as the old adage goes, losing one sense shall strengthen the others. The alligator rose to its hind legs and stood like a human swayed its head left from right, trying to get a scent. The alligator truly did look like a person in the low light, its size and the way it stood on two legs definitely giving off the impression. The beast lowered itself once more to all fours and began slowly crawling towards my grandfather. It had definitely smelled something, but it was finding it difficult thanks to the technique my grandfather had of smearing the muck over his body. Now sat less than a foot away, the putrid breath of the beast began to fog the camera lens. Just as it felt like this could be it, the sound of something large hitting something metal echoed around the tunnel. The alligator turned to face the noise, then with incredible speed it began crawling towards the cistern chamber. Slowly, my grandfather crawled out from his hiding place and followed after it, keeping in mind not to make too much noise himself. Bah! The sound of Ryan's shotgun being discharged forced my grandfather to stand up and sprint towards the cistern. Oh, it's got my leg. George, faster. Help. 
Ryan's blood-curdling screams made me feel sick to my stomach. And when the camera came into view, well, the view of the carnage made me sick. Ryan was crawling away slowly from the alligator, his left leg missing. Inside the beast's mouth was the missing appendage. The blood splattered across the beast's grey scales. <sighs> George fired his rifle from his tunnel, catching everyone off guard. As the alligator turned to face George, Ryan used what little strength he could to throw his shotgun to my grandfather. Faster than I'd ever seen anyone reload a weapon, my grandfather snapped the gun open, emptied the use shells and replaced them. As the alligator focused on George, who was busy reloading himself, my grandfather threw a large rock to get its attention. The beast turned to face my grandfather, and stood on its hind legs ready to crush him. Boom! My grandfather rolled to the left as the alligator dropped to the floor, dead. My grandfather had shot it near point blank through the underside of the jaw and into its head. By Joe Foster, you killed it. Not now, George. We need to get Ryan to a hospital, like right now. My grandfather interrupted. Understanding, George and my grandfather picked up Ryan and propped him up against the front seat of the truck. My grandfather took off the camera and threw it in the back of the truck, forgetting to turn it off. For the next 25 minutes, I could hear the car horns and see the cameras slide as they raced to the hospital. Footage ended abruptly as the camera quickly and violently smashed into one of the truck's sides. I was speechless. I felt so wrong, I was so unreal. Oh, with the monsters I'd been seeing in the tapes, my doubt of if any of this was fake was now being overshadowed. Tasting the dried vomit in my mouth, I pushed open the attic hatch and went to the bathroom. I brushed my teeth of any leftover vomit I'd spewed after seeing the carnage of Ryan's leg. I also decided it was best to splash some water onto my face. Perhaps it would help me. As I dried my face and looked into the mirror, I swore I could see what looked like a man in a black suit and tie with a large camera in place of its head. It quickly walked past the bathroom door and towards the master bedroom. Gong! The sound of the attic door shutting drew my attention away from what must have been a hallucination. I cursed myself for becoming far too jumpy, undoubtedly because I'd watched those stupid tapes. It's when I made a promise to myself. I'd finish watching all those tapes, no matter how freaky they were. I marched into the master bedroom and almost fell over. Quickly and unexpectedly, I was hit with vertigo, as the hallucination of my grandparents materialized in front of me. They sat in bed staring towards the walk-in wardrobe, their eyes bloodshot and their mouths hung open in mid-scream. And, as soon as it had started, it was over. There I was stood in the darkening master bedroom, hopefully alone. I flipped on the lights and shut the window blinds and made my way to the attic hatch. Strangely, the hatch was open, but just a peek. I swore bloody I'd left it open. I was in a rush after all, but how confident was I in that? After all, I'd just seen two extremely disturbing hallucinations in as many minutes. I grabbed the hatch and pulled it down, making my way back up into the attic. The attic was now getting too dark for me to see, as the light from outside quickly disappeared. I pulled out my phone and used it to find the TV. Using the static of the TV, I picked up the next tape and read its label. Bogeyman, London, 17th of October, 2004. I'd once believed that the bogeyman was living in my bedroom back in 2004, and I also remembered my grandfather making a point that the bogeyman wouldn't be bothering me again around the same time. In fact, he and some friends... Wait, was this tape to do with me? No, it couldn't be, could it? I pushed play on the VCR and watched the title card. Property of the Cryptozoological Hunter Society. The Bogeyman, Greenwich, London, 
2004. The camera switched to my mother's apartment, looking as filthy and unloved as it always had done. I would have been six at the time, although I know things were rough. My mother had a really tough hand dealt with her. Well, first her mother, as my grandmother, died from a shock-induced aneurysm when she was ten. Then, when she was sixteen, she fell pregnant with me. And finally, my deadbeat of a father just up and left us one day for a neighbor. Her negative energy did more than rub off on me. I became a sort of conduit for it, you could say, and that's what probably attracted the bogeyman in the first place. I remember how he would always show up at 4.44 and silently move around my room. Occasionally, my lights would briefly flicker on and would see his shadowy clad figure either clinging to the wall or standing at the foot of my bed. The night I reached my breaking point was when he began to crawl onto my bed. I could feel the talon-like nails gliding almost methodically up my sheets. I screamed and kicked the solid, shadowy mass off of me and ran for my door. I was down the hall and jumping over the sofa, trying to wake up my snoozing grandfather. He sat upright, but groggy, and asked me, What? Wait, slow down, where's the fire? After explaining that the bogeyman was in my room, all he did was chuckle and then check my room. At the time, he acted so straight-faced, he said to me, You're right, there is a bogeyman in there, but don't worry. I have some friends over who will help me get rid of him. Well, the next few days, both I and my mother stayed at my grandparents' house. I guess I was now going to get to see what really happened that night. Focusing back on the video... George had sat down with Ryan, and both men began loading silenced pistols. You're sure you're all right, Foster? quizzed Ryan. I mean, this is a personal matter, right? First, he tried to take Janice, and now he's gone for Howard. Man, you really upset him, didn't you? What do you expect, Ryan? I killed his family. Seems only right he wants to do the same to me. George, Ryan, and my grandfather began setting up traps all over my old bedroom. Flashbang trip mines at the foot of my bed, thumbtacks haphazardly sprawled over the floor, and a dummy that looked like me, containing a luminous yellow dye bomb. My grandfather hid the camera high on the very top of my wardrobe. Good night, Howard, my grandfather said loud enough to be heard throughout the apartment. After around four or so hours of absolutely nothing happening, a small TV in my old room turned on and cast vibrant blues and reds across the room. That's when I saw it, hanging upside down above my door, the shadowy monster that had haunted my younger childhood. I went still as I watched it climb its way down and onto the floor. In a brief moment, the lights went off and my room was once again plunged into darkness. A few seconds later, the TV burst back to life, only now the bogeyman had vanished from the room entirely. No matter where I looked, I couldn't see him. After playing a few scenes from a Japanese anime, my TV once again turned off, but this time I was watching intently for movement in the dark. I was paying so much attention that when the TV turned on again, I fell backwards, startled. Bogeyman was clinging to the ceiling almost face to face with the camera. He then silently dropped from the ceiling and crawled onto the bed and got up on top of the dummy. With a quick and brutal motion, it forced open the dummy, but was taken by surprise as the dummy exploded, covering the bogeyman in the paint. My bedroom door was kicked open, and then in walked Ryan, George, and my grandfather. Hello, ugly. Remember me, because I sure as hell remember you, said my grandfather. The room filled with silenced gunfire, as all three men emptied their entire gun clips into the shadowy beast's body. Once it fell, slumped to the floor, my grandfather took a machete that George had kept on his belt and cut off the bogeyman's head. Oh, it was brutal, but if what Ryan had said earlier was true, then this monster that had very nearly killed me had been hunting my family for a long time. Did that mean that this bogeyman had gone after my grandfather's family? Was it the reason that my mother had died? Did she wake up to see it and then she'd had an aneurysm? Then something else dawned on me. She died the exact same way as my grandfather. But he died after the Pokemon died, so perhaps not. 
No, that was oh, stupid. All of this was stupid. This was for some crazy hypothesis brought on by a stupid set of tapes. Shook my head and ejected the tape, not caring where I threw it. I took out the next tape from the box. The label was stained by coffee rings, and it read, A Bar and Beast, Dubai, 12th of May, 2005. The title guard did its normal rounds, although I barely noticed it anymore. Property of the Crypto Zoological Society, abhorrent out of deity, Business Bay, Dubai, 2005. The camera started with whoever was holding it, sprinting through an office building. A walkie-talkie crackled to life, and I got my answer as to who the mystery sprinter was. Pegleg, come in, Pegleg. This is Yankee. You better not have dropped my camera over. Ryan's voice came from behind the camera. This is Pegleg. Copy. I'm en route to the top of the action zone. Redcoat, copy. Did the CHS stash the key on the roof or in the elevator shaft? Over. This is Redcoat. Hard copy, Pegleg. The key is located above the elevator shaft. I'm in position here. How about you, Yankee? Over. This is Yankee. I'm in position with the lock copy. Just waiting on the key and the guard. Over. Ryan began sprinting up the stairs. I almost forgotten he'd lost his leg to the Gator Man back in Florida. Calling the elevator, Ryan climbed onto its top using the emergency hatch. After searching for a few moments, the key was found. Well, the key wasn't really a key. It was a detonation device. This is Pegleg. I have the key. Repeat, I have the key. All stations are go. Over. The first time in the tapes... I heard a response from people who weren't either Ryan George or my grandfather. This is Cujo, hard copy. Thumb is ready, over. This is T Knocker, hard copy. Index finger is prepped, over. This is Detart, hard copy. Middle finger is primed and pointed, over. This is G Slinger, hard copy. Ring finger ready, over. This is PD Clown, hard copy. Pinky's ready to be released. Over. I didn't know what anyone on the walkie-talkies was on about, other than that they had the components of a hand. My grandfather had a lock, and Ryan had a key. As Ryan reached the roof, I finally got to see the abomination called the Abhorrent Beast. Well, it was disgusting to look at. A living, breathing clump of pinkish flesh slithering its way through the city below. This is the warden to all teams' copy. Operation Burning the Fat is a go. Over. Numerous air raid sirens began to ring throughout the city. This is Redcoat. The gate's closed. Repeat, the gate is closed. Over. This is Yankee. Copy. The lock is on. Over. Ryan looked at the switch in his hand and took a deep breath as he flipped the toggle. This is Peglick. Good. Copy. The key is inserted. Over. The five separate missiles from the roofs of different buildings all launched simultaneously, heading towards the slithering mass. In a flurry of heat and bright light, the abhorrent beast was consumed by military-grade napalm, leaving nothing but a smoking lump of burning, putrid flesh. Mrs. Warden, copy. Everyone did great today. Operation Burning the Fat was a great success. Over and out. I ejected the tape. And the new burning question that toppled the pile of other questions was, who really is the CHS? Perhaps I'd find out in the next tape, or perhaps it'd just be another monster hunt. Well, with nothing left to lose, I grabbed the last tape and read its label. Greed, New England, 29th of August, 2006. Placing the tape into the VCR, I let the title card play. Property of the Cryptozoological Hunter Society. The Griefful One, Vermont, New England, 2006. Footage opened to an outdoor movie theater and the sounds of someone panicking and breathing heavily. The movie being played on the screen was Constantine, starring Keanu Reeves. However, it wasn't long before I heard my grandfather speak into his phone. George, wake up. God damn it, George, wake up. 
I couldn't hear George on the phone, but I could guess what he was saying by my grandfather's response. It's faster. We have a serious problem here. I know I'm on vacation, but this is a priority N9. My grandfather could barely continue talking before the wind started picking up. I strained my ears desperately, hoping to hear the conversation. Confirm sighting. Giant portal. One of the nine has risen, requesting assistance ASAP. This is all I could hear as the wind picked up even worse, masking all the sounds. Within 20 minutes, the film stopped being played and was instead replaced with text cards, similar to the title cards. Hello, patrons of Bethel Drive-In. We must halt tonight's film and play this public service announcement. Due to a nearby incident involving excavations of the nearby quarry, we must ask that all patrons stay inside your vehicles for the next six to seven hours. Do not go outside, do not drink any of the tap water, do not take a shower or bath until said time or until told so. Bottled water will be provided to all cars as soon as it's safe to do so. All vehicle users should turn off your engines, lights and electronic devices that you may be using and lie down away from the windows. It is recommended to utilize any form of noise-canceling headphones if you have any. If not, please place your fingers into your ears and hum loudly. It is not recommended that you try to drive and seek shelter elsewhere, especially around the vicinity of the drive-in theater. If you need to evacuate your vehicle, please do so in a calm manner, then quickly and quietly head towards wooded areas. Do not head towards any body of water. Well, it was around this point that the ground all around began shaking in the same way as if something was slowly walking. My grandfather got out of his car and started running towards the forest to the left. He never once looked back, never stopping for anything. The camera continued to record as the vibrations from outside became worse and worse. The wind was now heavily battering the cars at the drive-in and flipped a few of the lighter sports cars. The vibration stopped and something took hold of my grandfather's car and lifted it upwards. The footage became distorted as if someone had run a magnet across the cassette tape. The visuals were now pure static, but I could make out a shape. Something watched me from behind the distorted static. What sounded like a voice, quiet and weak. The voice someone would make if they'd been woken up prematurely and wanted to go back to sleep. Brothers, seek me. Father's grave, Patriarch's tomb. And with that, burn marks engulfed the remainder of the tape. I chalked it up to it having been destroyed when the car landed from impact. So I ejected the final tape. Well, what was going on here, I didn't know. My grandfather was a hunter of monsters for some shadowy organization. Was this what got him killed? Perhaps I would never find out, or perhaps... Perhaps I might just. I sat back and heard a crumpling noise. The videotape I'd found in my grandfather's bag. I took out one of the empty tapes and painstakingly wound the tape onto the cassette. Then, without thinking, I placed the last tape into the VCR. My grandfather sat opposite the camera, his face aged and dirty. Hello, don't know who will find the tape first. If it's Ryan, then you have to take this tape to the Commandant. If it's Howard, then keep watching and let me explain something. As you know by now, Howard, I'm a part of a group of hunters who seek out and destroy cryptids. That's some of the strange monsters you saw, but one of them has been following me for a long time and with good reason. When I was first inducted into the CHS, I was sent out on an easy task. Find a group of Kamara's heads and kill them. I followed this order to the letter. But I did something stupid and wrong. I missed one. And it saw me rip its father's head off. And that's the Kamara I've been using. And it came after me when it was old enough. It got mixed up on who to kill. While I was away, it attacked your grandmother. Forced her to live a night terror. And her mind couldn't take it. The Kamara came after you as well, but your mind couldn't comprehend it. You thought it was the bogeyman. And now you saw me beheaded, but that wasn't real. It was only projection. So it could see if I was weak enough. As you most probably saw, I wasn't. 
A large bang at the hatch dragged my gaze away, and there I saw it in the dark. A red flashing light. My grandfather continued in the background. My head knows I'm old now, and he's coming for me, to break my mind like I broke its family. And he's coming for you, Howard, and I'm so, so sorry. As the tape ended, the room filled with static. And then, I saw it. He stood slumped over, staring at me, his body a mechanical mesh of organic and electrical parts. It grabbed me and pulled me close to its lens began to shake violently in its hands, and images of horrible, evil, and unknown things swarmed my vision, and then darkness. I woke up in a private hospital room. Standing away from me were two men. As I began to rise, they turned around. One of them was a military-looking commander of some type, and the other was Ryan. Easy there. Just relax, Howard, said Ryan. We have a lot to talk about involving you and the CHS. Well, a pretty cool granddad, I suppose. Uh, a lot more interesting than uh, many of ours, I'm sure. Right up until the point where he unleashed some uh, devilish thing upon his grandson, I suppose. <laughs> oh well, you win some, you lose some. That's a very interesting story, and it seems like there's a lot more mileage in that one. So hopefully be seeing a lot more to come. We shall wait and see. Well, Christmas is almost upon us, and I've got a well, something special lined up for you in the coming days. In the coming weeks, anyway. Before New Year, definitely. But that's enough for me for one evening. Till the next time, my dear friends. Very, very sweet dreams. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this story today. It really means a lot to me and to the author of the story, of course. Well, if you want to know more about me, I'm pretty much everywhere on social media. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can download my music on SoundCloud. Um, I've got a Patreon if you feel like. Throw me a dollar or two. Very much appreciated. And of course, on Reddit, I have a place where you can leave stories if you want me to read one that you've written. Well, hoping to see you all again very soon. Till then, sweet dreams. Bye-bye.